So thank you everybody for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Joshua Karasak. I'm a winemaking specialist with Anartis USA. And uh, this is the first uh, webinar that we're doing for the uh, 2020 year. Um, the presentation is going to be on avoiding reduction. So let's go ahead and get started then. So if you've never been to one of our webinars before, um, or as a general refresher, this is how our webinars work. So I'm going to do a 40-minute presentation from uh, beginning to end, uh, hopefully without any interruption. Then after the presentation, we're going to do a 15, and 20, uh, 15 to 20-minute 20 uh, question and answer session. During the presentation, we'll ask that you please uh, hold your questions for the designated question and answer at the end of the presentation. So there's a chat box on the right side of your viewing pane. If you could avoid using that chat box for questions during the presentation and just wait until the very end to ask your questions, that'll really help with um, keeping people focused on the presentation and it can be quite distracting with that chat box being very active during the presentation. If you're having technical difficulties, you can, uh, you can put that in the chat box and we have somebody that can help you uh, with your technical difficulties. So they'll private message you and, and help you with that. If the chat box is being really distracting for you and you don't want to see it, you can always toggle it closed by just pushing the little arrow next to the chat box and that'll close it for you. And that'll also widen and open up the uh, uh, presentation screen so it's a little bit larger as well. And then this is going to be a recorded session. Uh, so you'll have access to the session afterwards. So if you miss something during the presentation, don't worry. You can always rewatch the presentation at a later time. So as a general overview, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the different types of volatile sulfur compounds or uh, VSCs, some of the sources of the volatile sulfur compounds um, in wine, and then some of the solutions that we have for reductive wines. So we'll go ahead and start the presentation with a quick poll question. So I'm going to open up the poll for us and if you'll just give me a second. Okay, so uh, here's the poll question. On a scale from one to five, one being the lowest, how difficult was this year for you from a reduction standpoint? And I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to go ahead and answer that question. like a little more than half of us have voted now, so I'll just give a little bit more time for more people to vote if they want to. Okay, I'll go ahead and share the results now. So it looks like about 72% of us voted so far. Um, it looks like about 9% of us said that we didn't have any reductive issues, which is great. 27% of us said that we had a below average year, which is good. That means that you have less reductive issues. 30% of us showed that we had an average year. 15% of us was above average and 3% of us were high. So that's good to see that uh, less people were having issues this year. Um, it looks like we still had a majority of us had an average year in terms of reduction, which means that we probably had some lots that were a little bit reductive. So that's good to see. So we'll go ahead and go back to presentation now. So now let's just talk about what some of the main sulfur uh, compounds are in wine. Uh, so let me just pull up a little pointer first so that you guys can see. So um, hydrogen sulfide is the first one I'll talk about. That's probably the most common um, volatile sulfur compound that we see during fermentation and then the early phases of winemaking. So in the fermentation, we can produce quite a lot of hydrogen sulfide uh, through uh, various uh, avenues. Uh, 
mostly through yeast metabolism and um, and driv uh, driven by microbial um, interactions in the wine. But also there's some speculation that um, elemental sulfur in the reductive conditions of fermentation can spontaneously form hydrogen sulfide as well. So, um, but during the fermentation primarily is when we're going to see most of the hydrogen sulfide being uh, produced. And it has sort of this eggy, um, rotten egg kind of aroma. It's not very pleasant. So generally, um, we want to be able to avoid it if possible. Mercaptans are probably the more troublesome form of uh, volatile sulfur compounds. Uh, they are also formed uh, through some um, yeast metabolites and through the fermentation, um, but also formed after fermentation as well uh, in the aging process. They tend to have this sort of garlic kind of onion aroma. They can also smell like rotten cabbage or uh, burnt rubber. And in general, they are also very unpleasant to have at high levels in the wine. If we have oxidative conditions with mercaptans present, those mercaptans can bind to form disulfides. Uh, disulfides have a higher sensory uh, threshold limit, which means that it takes more of uh, disulfides to be able to actually perceive them aromatically. So um, if we have mercaptans and we undergo oxidative conditions, we can form disulfides, which can sometimes obscure the, um, the reduction. Um, but if we have reductive conditions with the disulfides present, those disulfides can break and become mercaptans again. So we have this sort of equilibrium between disulfides and mercaptans. That's all based off of um, how much oxygen basically we have in the wine. And then we have hydrogen sulfide, which is again, probably more prominent, um, prominent during fermentation, can also uh, remain in the wine post-fermentation as well. So uh, what are some of the sources of reduction? Um, for hydrogen sulfide, some of the main sources are going to come in, uh, during fermentation. So uh, one thing I'm going to highlight in this presentation is the effect of sulfur sprays. Both wettable and elemental forms of sulfur can have a very strong impact on the amount of hydrogen sulfide that we produce during the fermentation. Sulfite additions can also uh, impact the amount of hydrogen sulfide that's produced. And then yeast metabolism and nutrition. So these are the three uh, main sources I'm going to talk about uh, today. There are a slew of other sources of, um, of volatile sulfur compounds that can, um, that can occur in the winemaking process, but these are the ones I'm just going to sort of focus on today. Uh, just with the limitations in time, we can't really talk about everything, but I think these ones are uh, important to focus on because these are things that we can actually uh, do something about in the winemaking process. And so they're, they're actionable things that we can control. And so important for us to be aware of them. So sulfur sprays, uh, both elemental and wettable sulfur, two different forms of sulfur, um, can strongly impact the amount of hydrogen sulfide that's produced in the fermentation. So one recommendation that's been, um, that's been given is less than one microgram uh, of sulfur per gram of grapes um, is a good, uh, a good metric for basically preventing some of the hydrogen sulfide that could be uh, resulting from elemental sulfur. So this graph over here on the right, I'll just quickly go over. On the y-axis, we have the amount of hydrogen sulfide produced. On the x-axis, we have the, minor, the amount of colloidal sulfur that's present um, in the must uh, prior to fermentation. So um, what, what was basically shown in this uh, paper from uh, Ralph Kunke and, and Michael Schutz is basically in the fermentation, the amount of colloidal sulfur that we have is nearly a linear relationship to the amount of hydrogen sulfide that can be produced from that colloidal sulfur. So during fermentation, if we have a lot of colloidal sulfur present, elemental sulfur present, uh, we can produce a lot of hydrogen sulfide. And so that sulfur is coming from sulfur sprays, uh, which is a, um, is a, basically a method for reducing the amount of powdery mildew pressure that you can have or a way of um, controlling powdery mildew. So I'll go over that in a couple of minutes, but um, just know that sulfur sprays for powdery mildew uh, strongly impact the amount of hydrogen sulfide produced in the fermentation. So this other graph over here on the left, I'll just go over really quickly with some uh, work done, I believe at uh, Cornell from Gavin Sachs, 
uh, Wayne Wilcox and um, Kwasniewski. And what they did is they looked at uh, sulfur residue on the grapes at different time periods applied before harvest. So at 50 days applied before harvest, at 35 days applied before harvest, 22 and eight days. And then they, what they did is um, at those different time points, they measured the sulfur residue on the grapes that were harvested. And they also looked at different forms of sulfur applied at different rates as well. So the uh, kind of white bar here uh, represents micronized or elemental sulfur. The uh, lighter gray is a, well, um, is a wettable sulfur applied at 5.38 kilograms per hectoliter, or per hectare, sorry. And then the darkest gray bar is wettable sulfur applied at 2.69 kilograms per hectare. And what they showed basically is the residue of, um, of sulfur that's present at these different time points with these different applications. So at 50 days, which is close to two months before harvest, there's still a little bit of micronized sulfur present uh, at harvest. At 35 days, which is over a month before harvest, with the applied sulfur um, at 5.38 and the elemental form, we can see that we are well above a one, point, a one microgram per gram recommendation uh, for hydrogen sulfide production. So this, the wine produced from this must with this amount of sulfur spray uh, would likely have hydrogen sulfide issues. And then these two other applications are still quite low, but still may have some hydrogen sulfide issues with this wettable sulfur applied even a month or over a month uh, before harvest. And then at 22 days, you can see there's a huge jump in terms of the amount of uh, sulfur residues. So if you're applying sulfur even three weeks before harvest, you're gonna definitely have some, some sulfide issues. And then eight days, this is gonna be really, really bad uh, reduction in the, in the fermentation. So why that might be uh, an issue in this year in particular for some of the surrounding regions uh, for where we are in Sonoma, this is just an example of some uh, data pulled from this last vintage, looking at the powdery mildew index, which is a UC Davis um, metric for the amount of powdery mildew pressure that can be occurring in, in different, um, at different time points. So based off of the climactic conditions, this index basically indicates how high the pressure might be for powdery mildew at a given time. And so uh, just looking at Carnero, Strike Creek, and Russian River, which are three regions in the Sonoma area and also in uh, Napa, we can see that from, let's say, June through August, there were several weeks worth of time where uh, we were well above uh, the 60 uh, mark on the index, which means that we're spraying sulfur basically at a seven day interval. So every seven days we're spraying sulfur in the vineyard to try and deal with powdery mildew during this, during this time frame. So what this can mean is that we are accumulating a lot of uh, sulfur during this period of time. So in particular, this year might have been quite difficult for these regions for, uh, for reduction because um, the the powdery mildew pressure is higher and thus we are spraying more sulfur in the vineyard to try and deal with it. And thus we may have more um, reduction issues. So in particular this, this year, uh, we, we had expected to see um, more reduction issues because of this uh, problem. Um, but apparently it was a fairly average year for reduction for, uh, for many of the attendees today. So another source of reduction that can, that can be um, problematic is SO2. So yeast can form H2S through all different kinds of uh, manners. They can take sulfate in from the outside of the cell and, and that goes through a pathway that can become um, uh, hydrogen sulfide, or they can bring in SO2 um, and also that can uh, become a uh, hydrogen sulfide byproduct as well. So um, SO2 can play a strong role in uh, formation of hydrogen sulfide in the fermentation, depending on the yeast strain that you're using. Uh, so that's not something I'm going to get into in this presentation in, in strong depth is the different kinds of yeast strains and how they can produce hydrogen sulfide. Um, that's something that I will save for uh, next year prior to harvest. But for now, uh, when we're looking at um, potential sources of hydrogen sulfide, just know that yeast can take up uh, sulfite and spit it out as H2S. So it's one more reason to control your sulfite um, applications as, as much as possible.
uh, prior to prior to fermentation and prior to uh, the start of fermentation. So um, most of you are probably well aware of this, but uh, nitrogen is also a really um, strong impact on uh, hydrogen sulfide production in the fermentation. So ensuring your yeast assimilable nitrogen is at a um, reasonable level before before fermentation can also help limit the amount of hydrogen sulfide production as well. Uh, so this is just some data that was collected uh, a while back. Um, and looking at hydrogen sulfide production with um, non, um, so in this, in this trial, basically what they did is they applied uh, 25 grams per hectoliter of nitrogen uh, during the fermentation and they treated sample. And then in the untreated samples, uh, they did not uh, add any uh, nitrogen. And you can see in the uh, samples treated with the nitrogen, we had significantly lowers of H2S uh, production in the fermentation. So basically what this is showing is that YAN does have a very strong impact on the formation of hydrogen sulfide and ensuring that you have proper YAN levels is going to help uh, with limiting that production as well. So yet another thing that uh, we can do to control our hydrogen sulfide production. And then this is just another way of looking at that uh, in a different uh, manner. What they did is they added to a particular uh, must different amounts of nitrogen, increasing uh, nitrogen additions. And what they saw was um, a steady decrease in the amount of H2S produced from those different additions. Um, so increasing nitrogen led to a decrease in the hydrogen sulfide in that case as well. So yet another way that we can control hydrogen sulfide production and the fermentation is just making sure that you have the proper amount of uh, yan in your, um, in your must before. And 10 milligrams per liter of yan is, is one metric um, for every uh, bricks fermented. So that's one way of ensuring that you have proper yan levels is just using that general rule of thumb, uh, which is 10 milligrams per liter of yan for every one bricks fermented. Um, and you can do these uh, yan additions um, in, in various forms, but most people are using uh, DAP or complex nutrients mixed with dimonium phosphate. Um, in addition, yeah, yeast derivatives, um, both as a rehydration nutrient and also as um, additions during fermentation. Yet again, another uh, yeast metabolism and nutrition related uh, topic is uh, pantothenic acid. So low pantothenic acid can lead to more hydrogen sulfide production. So pantothenic acid is a um, natural uh, vitamin in uh, grape must and yeast need it to uh, ferment and uh, produce uh, the amino acids that they need. So uh, what this uh, research showed was that in different uh, nitrogen regimes, so at low nitrogen and at high nitrogen, uh, increasing pantothenic acid decreased the amount of hydrogen sulfide produced in both situations, both in low nitrogen and high nitrogen. The low nitrogen was 60 milligrams per liter of, of nitrogen, is, which is quite low, and then high was 250 milligrams per liter. And you can see that in both cases, uh, increasing pantothenic acid decreased the amount of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, so uh, one of the tools that you can use for this would be something like our NutriFirm Energy, which is a yeast rehydration nutrient that has lots of pantothenic acid in it. So by rehydrating with this um, rehydration nutrient, you can ensure that you have the proper pantothenic acid uh, required for the yeast to avoid this situation where you're producing a lot of hydrogen sulfide. And notice that even in high nitrogen situations, uh, low pantothenic acid actually produces greater, um, greater issues. So even if you have a lot of nitrogen, if you don't have the proper pantothenic acid, you can still produce a lot of hydrogen sulfide. So just keep that in mind for your nutrient regimen and your fermentation. So now we can do a second poll question. I'll go ahead and open that up. So which tools do you most use for handling reductive lines post fermentation? Do you use oxygen and aeration, copper sulfate, ascorbic acid, or enological tannins? <laughs> 
And we'll give you guys a couple of minutes to go ahead and vote here. Remember, we're talking about post-fermentation as well. This is this is after fermentation is finished. Okay, so it looks like most of us have finished voting now. So I'll go ahead and close the uh, the poll. So what we can see is most people are using oxygen or aeration to deal with uh, reduction post-fermentation. Second, most of us are using copper sulfate, which is uh, something I'll go into in, in pretty good detail in a couple of minutes. Some of us are using ascorbic acid, which is a good tool for dealing with disulfide-related um, reduction. And then uh, some of us are using enological tannins, which is probably the lesser known uh, treatment for mercaptan based sulfides. And I'll, I'll detail that in a couple of minutes as well. So this is a very interesting result. Thank you for voting. So now we're gonna talk again uh, about the different tools for, for treating reductive wines. So oxygen, actually, while useful during fermentation, is not much of a help for wine remediation. Uh, this has been shown in several different uh, different uh, papers, but basically what can happen is that hydrogen sulfide can actually uh, get turned into a mercaptan if you are oxygenating a wine post-fermentation. And, um, and then also what can happen is that if you have a mercaptan-based um, reduction, when you are oxygenating that wine post fermentation, all you're doing is basically taking that mercaptan and changing it into a disulfide. And when I mentioned before, disulfides have a higher sensory threshold than mercaptans. So essentially what you're doing is you're taking the, the um, sulfur compound and you're hiding it in a form of a disulfide because you're taking something like a mercaptan as a lower sensory threshold, which means you can smell it at a lower concentration and you're oxygenating it into something that has a higher threshold, which means that it's a um, it's something that you can't smell at lower concentrations. And so what can happen is that that pool of disulfides in a reductive condition can once again release to um, to become a mercaptan again, and then the reduction can appear later on. And that's something that can happen, let's say, if the wine um, is put into a screw cap uh, sort of closure in the bottling process or it's something that can happen in a tank if the wine becomes reductive in a tank, or it can be something if, let's say you are canning the product, then it can uh, basically reappear after canning has occurred. So those different sulfur uh, compounds can basically re reappear essentially under reductive conditions um, if you treat with oxygen post-fermentation. So just something to keep in mind. Copper sulfate is um, a very effective binder of hydrogen sulfide and also some are captains. Uh, works very, very quickly to bind uh, sulfides and um, and can basically make them disappear, which is which is very good. But they don't just disappear. They actually remain in the wine in the form of a copper bound to a um, copper bound to sulfur. And we'll go more into detail about that in a couple of minutes. So that's that's probably the most effective and widely used for hydrogen sulfide, um, as well as some are captains can be bound by the copper as well. Enological tannins is probably the lesser known uh, treatment for mercaptans. And something that I hope you'll take away from this presentation is they can actually be quite effective tools for, um, for dealing with mercaptan-based um, sulfur compounds. And then ascorbic acid, uh, this is a basically vitamin C that's essentially what it does is it scavenges all the oxygen from the wine and makes the conditions quite reductive. So when you have something like disulfides that I mentioned before, which under reductive conditions, you can break a disulfide and form um, two mercaptans. What, basically what you can do is in order to treat disulfides, because disulfides can't be bound by copper sulfate or enological tannins. What you can do is by adding ascorbic acid, you can force a reductive condition in the wine 
which breaks those disulfides and the mercaptans, and then those mercaptans can then be bound by copper sulfate or by the enological tannins. So that's one way of treating that form of, of sulfines. So now I'm going to focus on uh, copper sulfate and the application of copper sulfate for treating reduction. So copper sulfate works really well for H2S, but I just warn you to be careful uh, when using it. It's really, really important that you do copper sulfate trials because um, copper does a lot of, of different things in wine. And one thing that copper does is it acts as a catalyst for oxidation. So um, this is some work that was done by John Danilovich um, in 2007, but it's something that's been repeated uh, over and over again. So what we have here on the Y axis in this graph is a reduction in free sulfur concentration. So this means Basically, this reduction of free uh, sulfur concentration is akin to oxidation that's occurring. So this, the more reduction SO, uh, free SO2, the, uh, essentially the more oxidation you have occurring. And this is basically time right here. And what we have here is a, um, basically a, a model wine that has uh, some phenolic compounds present and also has iron and copper present. And what he did uh, is he basically looked at different concentrations of iron and copper and looked at how much uh, reduction of free SO2 when he, um, when he sparged the uh, sample with oxygen. So A is with no iron and no copper. You can see that there's very little reduction in free SO2. There's no oxidation occurring. B is when we have a little bit of copper. So you can see that this jump right here shows that some oxidation is occurring with just only copper present. With a little bit of iron present, we see a similar thing. With more iron, we see just a little bit of um, more oxidation that occurs. And then when we have a little bit of iron and copper present, we have this huge jump in oxidation. So iron and copper are both uh, strong players in, um, in oxidation chemistry. And then look at the difference between these two different uh, lines right here. So E is 0 0.05 milligrams per liter of copper, which is a very minuscule amount of copper in the wine, a very small amount of copper. 0.15 milligrams per liter is probably a very common amount of copper found in wines. It's still a small amount. It's um, not a huge amount, but you can see that the difference between E and F in terms of how quickly this, um, this, this model solution is oxidizing is um, pretty pretty great. So uh, what it's showing is that uh, increasing amount of copper can actually basically increase the amount of oxidation that you have and increase the rate of oxidation. So be careful when you're adding copper sulfate to wine because essentially what you're doing is you're making that wine more susceptible to quick and rapid oxidation. The other thing to consider about uh, copper when you're adding it to uh, wine is that um, the prevailing theory was for a long time that when you added copper to a wine with uh, hydrogen sulfide, that the copper bound to the hydrogen sulfide and that uh, that copper bound sulfide would then become a solid and precipitate out of the wine. And then uh, you could rack off of it or you could filter out that, um, that precipitate. But uh, work more recently has shown that that copper bound sulfur does not actually precipitate out of the wine. And so this is a little bit of a complicated graph, but I'm going to quickly go over what it is. So what they did is they uh, treated uh, four different samples, four different sample types with copper at two milligrams per liter uh, and hydrogen sulfide as well. So what they also, um, what they also showed was that uh, with the black, red, blue, and yellow uh, lines here. Uh, the black represents a model wine solution with no actual wine uh, included in it. The red line represents a 5% uh, or 1% wine solution. The blue line represents a 5% wine solution and a uh, yellow line represents a 10% wine solution. What they did is they added varying amounts of wine into this model solution. And what they showed is that um, sure model wines Okay, and then uh, so also what they did is they filtered those different samples through a 0.45 and a 2 micron um, filter. And essentially what they showed is that in a model wine solution, copper does bind to sulfur and is able to be removed with filtration. But as we actually uh, work with real wines, what we see is that in real wine situations, so as we increase the amount of actual wine in this solution, 
uh, we see that we don't see the same kind of interaction when we are filtering it. We're not actually removing that um, precipitate or that um, copper bound sulfur from the uh, from the wine. So essentially what this shows is that when you add copper into a wine to treat uh, hydrogen sulfide, you may not be forming those uh, those precipitates and you may not be removing it from the wine itself. So you still have copper that's bound to sulfur present in the wine itself. Uh, so this is an interesting, interesting work that's been done showing that physical filtration may not be removing it. They also showed that some membrane filters may adorb some of the copper uh, bound uh, sulfides, but that just by racking or by physical filtration with pad filters, we certainly are not removing those copper bound sulfides. So some interesting work done in Australia and it was done previously in Spain as well. So um, just something to keep in mind that those copper uh, bound to sulfur, uh, sulfur is, is not really leaving the wine. Something else to consider is that hydrogen sulfide and methane thiol that are bound to copper or bound to other things, because they can bind to other things as well, they can bind to quinones or, or other compounds in the wine. When we have those compounds in reductive conditions, what they can do is they can actually release the hydrogen sulfide, or release the methane thiol um, in those reductive conditions. So again, if we put wine into a screw cap, if we put wine into a can, if a wine is sitting in a tank, what can happen is that if we don't have a lot of oxygen, those forms that are bound can essentially release those compounds. So with copper, you can release hydrogen sulfide or methane thiol if you've, if you've treated that wine with those compounds and the compounds are still present in the wine. So prevailing thought was before that we added copper to a wine with hydrogen sulfide, it would bind to that um, hydrogen sulfide and precipitate out, we would rack off and then we, it would be gone. Now what we know is that that copper bound to the sulfide is not really precipitating out as we thought it was. It's remaining in the wine. And if that wine sees reductive conditions, what can happen is that copper bound to the sulfur can release. So something to keep in mind if you're planning on putting a wine that was treated for reduction into a screw cap or into a can product, you may want to consider looking more strongly at one, the papers that I, um, that I showed from the previous slide and also understanding that you may not be removing uh, those compounds from that kind of uh, filtration or from racking. <clears throat> Some more exciting work that's been done uh, from the AWRI is looking at PVI PVP, which is a polymer that is, uh, was typically used for removing uh, labile copper and iron. And what they've shown is in two different um, scenarios right here, we had a white wine and a red wine. We had a, uh, a couple of treatments that were done to a, a wine that, was, um, that had copper bound sulfides present. So they measured the copper bound sulfides present in these wines and they treated with PVI PVP and a blend containing PVI PVP. And what they showed is that those two um, compounds, when you treated the wine, were able to remove the non-labile copper or the copper that's bound to these, um, these sulfides. So this is really interesting to see that there's there's a way of actually removing those um, those copper bound sulfides with this with this polymer PVI PVP, and this is again in, in a red wine showed similar results uh, when we treated with the um, with the two different versions containing the PVI PVP that there was some removal of those um, copper bound sulfides. So this may be a good way of treating wines. Um, after um, after treatment with copper sulfate, just to remove those copper bound sulfides to make sure that they don't release the hydrogen sulfide in the uh, and if you put it into a screw cap or into a, a can. And, and now I'm just going to show you two different uh, products that we offer at an artist for um, for that same application, which would be uh, two PVI PVP containing products are Claral HM, which is a blend of PVI PVP and preactivated chitosan. So that's uh, a blend that's able to remove uh, copper and iron and presumably copper bound sulfate uh, as well. I'm sorry, uh, copper bound sulfides as well. And then uh, stable met, which is a, a more pure version of PVI, PVP and silica. Um, and if we were just to look at the amount of copper that's removed uh, from, the, from the standpoint of a residual copper, um, when we looked at, let's say, this Pinot, Pinot Noir that had 0.4 milligrams per liter, a 20 milligrams, a 20 grams per hectoliter of the stable met, we're able to remove nearly all of the uh, copper, which will help 
one with oxidation, but also with the potential for uh, reductive compounds reappearing. And then at 50 grams per hectoliter, we're able to remove it below the um, detection limit on our machines. And then similar thing with our Claral HM, 20 grams per hectoliter, we're able to remove most of the copper, and then 50 grams per hectoliter, remove it below um, detection limit. So again, two, two tools that could be helpful in that situation with uh, when you're treating a wine with copper. So some more sources of reduction, um, mercaptans. So uh, mercaptans, some of the main sources, yeast metabolism, nutrition, through the fermentation, we can produce some of these mercaptans. So some of this garlic kind of onion, cabbage -y kind of aroma. And then uh, also through the degradation of, um, of sulfur amino acids in wine, we can, copper actually helps catalyze the degradation of these, these sulfur-based um, amino acids. And so yet another reason why copper can be problematic from a reduction standpoint uh, this is some work that was done by uh, Vincente Ferreira, and basically what he showed was that, um, and this is, this is work, was, I'm sorry, it was done by Ricardo Lopez and Sandra Gonzalez, and what they showed was that um, in a wine where they treated it with copper and then uh, put it in anoxic conditions with no oxygen at high temperature, what they showed was that the copper was influencing the production of hydrogen sulfide and the production of methane thiol from a really high degree. So if this wine has uh, sulfur-based amino acids present, so, uh, so this, this is a synthetic solution with um, amino acids present and wine phenols. And what they showed was that the um, amino acids were being uh, basically converted with the copper addition to uh, methane thiol. So yet another reason why copper is important for um, production of of reductive compounds and um, another reason why we should try and control it as much as possible. So now I'm going to talk about the last tool um, for treatment of mercaptan based uh, reduction, which is probably less known in the industry um, is the um, is tannins basically. And enological tannins are something that we have a lot of experience with uh, working with reductive wines. And this was some data collected in 2001 showing the amount of ethyl um, or captain after treatment with different kinds of tannins. We had grapeseed tannin without oxygen, grapeseed tannin with oxygen, oak tannin without oxygen, and oak tannin with oxygen. And we can see that oak tannin with a little bit of oxygen actually was a pretty uh, good treatment for eliminating a lot of the ethyl mercaptans or some of the mercaptans over time. So we, we see these, these tannins work in, at different capacities depending on the wine itself and depending on the uh, dosage of tannin. So it, this reaction can take time to occur. Um, in this particular experiment, uh, experiment it took a, a while for all of the mercaptan to bind to the tannin. But um, what we've seen also is that in, even in bench trials that we've seen a significant reduction in, in the amount of um, mercaptan-based uh, sulfides uh, within the, the span of the uh, of the trial, which is usually within a couple of days after treatment. So we do recommend uh, giving these tannins a try for, for your wines if they are reductive. It, it can be a lot more gentle way of dealing with reduction than using copper sulfate. And um, and in general, the tannins can improve the um, the aspects of the sensory aspects of the wine as well. So these are the three different tannins that we use uh, regularly for reduction. We have Tanmax Nature, which is a condensed analogic tannin. Uh, we use it at gram, uh, three to 10 grams per hectoliter, depending on the wine. And it was really originally developed for avoiding volatile sulfur compounds in Prosecco. So uh, what that means is that even in very fruity light wines, that this tannin can be used in low dosages, <laughs> low dosages with great effect. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, the next one would be a tan SLI, which is probably one of my uh, go-to tannins for dealing with reductive wines. It's an allergic tannin that's taken from untoasted oak that avoids high temperature extraction. And, um, and we use this in between one and five grams per hectoliter. It works really, really well in um, white wines at low dosages. I don't use it in high dosages because it can change the color of the, of the white wine at high dosages. But at low dosages in white wines and at high dosages in red wines, it works really, really well for reduction. And then Tannin Lavage and Elagic Tannin from Seasoned French Oak. This one gives a little bit more of a sensory impact than the SLI, the Tan Max Nature. Uh, so a little bit more stringency and, and can actually give some uh, more body to the wine. Uh, 
Uh, this one's better for red wines, in my opinion, um, and we use it between one and five grams per hectoliter. For sulfide trials, this is a way to um, test for sulfides in your wine, and it's a, sort of a, a rough test to be able to determine what kind of sulfides you have present. So what you'll do is you'll start with, let's say, four bottles of, of uh, wine that you can treat. To a control, you don't add anything. To a, um, to a one bottle, you'll add 0.2 grams per hectoliter of copper sulfate. To another bottle, you'll add two grams per hectoliter of tannin lavage. And then to the uh, fourth bottle, you'll add uh, ascorbic acid and tannin lavage together. And the interpretation that you have from uh, from the um, from the wines, if the odor disappears in the copper sulfate treatment, it can be either H2S or mercaptans. If the odor disappears in the tan elevage treatment, it's likely mercaptan based um, sulfide. If the odor disappears after ascorbic acid and tan elevage treatment, then it's likely a disulfide. So that's just one way that you can sort of test to see uh, what kind of sulfides you have present. And what you also learn is what's the best sort of treatment for eliminating that um, that sulfide as well. And so this is just some different sensory thresholds. Again, I'm going to point out that disulfides have a much higher sensory threshold than uh, hydrogen sulfide and mercaptans. So something to keep in mind as well. So I know I kind of blew through a lot of information there. Um, again, this is this presentation is going to be available as a um, as a recording, uh, but just some conclusions. Dealing with volatile sulfur compounds can be really tricky, and uh, you know, sulfur chemistry is not a, a easy thing to interpret. Um, and sulfides are are something that can be difficult to uh, to avoid. Um, but with some of the information today, hopefully, it'll help you guys avoid uh, some of the problems in the future. Elemental sulfur is a major contributor to hydrogen sulfide uh, formation and, and fermentation, and uh, you should be careful and and maybe even uh, also interested in what kind of uh, sulfur regiment your uh, vineyards are, are using to, uh, to a greater extent to find out um, if, you know, some of the reduction you're having is from the uh, elemental sulfur. Yeast nutrition is an important factor for limiting um, the H2S formation. So keep in mind that, um, you know, giving your yeast the proper rehydration nutrient, giving them the proper yan will help limit the amount of hydrogen sulfide produced. Copper fining. Uh, helps with hydrogen sulfide, but can have some really negative consequences for oxidation. And you have the potential to re-release that hydrogen sulfide in low redox conditions if you don't do anything about that um, about that copper-based sulfide. Tools like Stable Met and Clairol HM can help remove excess copper and copper-bound sulfides. And tannins can help reduce copper levels or help reduce mercaptan-based uh, volatile sulfur compounds. And uh, at any point, if you if you feel that you want to try out some of those tannins. Feel free to call our um, offices and request some of the tannin samples. We're happy to send those out to you so you can do some bench trials for yourself. So I just want to thank everybody for your participation so far. Um, I appreciate you uh, joining the webinar. I'm going to open up the question and answer session in just a couple of, uh, of minutes. And we'll go ahead and start accepting questions from, from people. Okay, so now we're going to start answering questions. So Kevin Mills says, sulfur additions at the crusher recommended. So SO2 additions of the crusher, um, there's a lot of different reasons why you add SO2 to the crusher. I mean, it's it's something you use as an antimicrobial, it's something you use as um, an antioxidant. Um, so it is recommended uh, for for some for some musts, like especially if you're going to go into a cold soak as a red, for a red wine, you definitely want to have SO2 there. For a for a white wine or for a, a white must for, for grapes. Certainly as an antioxidant, you want to have it there to make sure you're not oxidizing that, that product. But try and limit it as much as possible. Try lower additions to try and limit the amount of SO2 that you're adding so that you don't get you know, these huge reduction issues in the after the fermentation. So 
As to two additions, yes, they are recommended and, and under certain condi conditions to protect the wine or, uh, or the must. But just try and limit them so that you're not adding huge amounts, you know, like 60 or 80 part ads might not be necessary. So Josh Reiterman asks, I believe you mentioned treatment with both copper sulfate as well as ascorbic acid. Is copper sulfate and ascorbic acid additions made simultaneously? So when you make a, when you make an ascorbic acid addition, um, what, what's going to happen is that the ascorbic acid is going to scavenge oxygen. And it's going to produce peroxide in the wine. So it is good to have a little bit of sulfite present in that as well, um, just to kind of capture any of that um, hydrogen peroxide that's produced in that. Um, so you'd add the ascorbic acid and you can add the copper sulfate right after that. Um, and that's, that's not an issue to uh, add them, you know, one after the other. And, um, and then you'll probably wait, let's say, a day or two before assessing that wine. I usually recommend two days for the trial um, in terms of when to start assessing the wines. Uh, two days is usually a good amount to let the copper do its, its full magic um, before, um, before it's, it's made its effect. Alex Reynolds is asking, what is the typical concentration of pantothenic acid in grape must and what concentration do you recommend for healthy fermentation? So pantothenic acid is something that is extremely variable depending on the site and depending on the vintage. Um, it can, it's, it's actually a little bit rare to see a complete deficiency of pantothenic acid, um, but sometimes you can see levels as low as 100, um, even lower than that. But most, most musts are between 250 and 300, and 250 is generally a good, uh, a good number to be at from what you saw. But just keep in mind that there could be a potential lot that has low uh, pantothenic acid. And so that's why uh, if you're not measuring it, it's good to make sure that you're giving the yeast some kind of complex nutrient that has pantothenic acid in the beginning so that you don't, you, could, you basically eliminate that potential threat of H2S by ensuring that you must have that pantothenic acid present. Um, and, and not only for that reason, but also for the, you know, for the sake of having a, a strong fermentation as well. Um, Don Dolan is asking, when do you use enological tannins? At what stage can you do this addition? So enological tannins, I would add uh, post-fermentation. You can add them at any point, basically, after fermentation is complete. And so um, just before aging, you know, just before MLF, after MLF, any of those time points are okay. Anytime after fermentation, basically, is when you would use those tannins for reduction. Obviously, tannins can be added at any point during fermentation, but for the sake of treating reduction, it's typically at the point when you have the reduction that you would treat with those tannins. John Levenberg asks, what was the rate of addition of PVP that showed the effective removal of copper-bound sulfides? So it's going to change depending on the wine matrix itself. Um, so for the removal of the copper bound sulfides, we typically look between a 20 and 50 grams per hectoliter. I believe the, the trials that were done by the AWRI were at 50 grams per hectoliter. And uh, so that's a decent amount of PVI PVP added. Um, but in general, uh, that's, that's what you would probably want to add to ensure that you're removing most of those copper bound sulfides. Um, but again, it's gonna depend on the wine too and how much copper bound sulfide you have. So that's something that usually we would, we would usually do a trial to test how much copper is removed. Um, we don't really have a good trial method yet for copper bound sulfides, um, but consider that probably 50 grams per hectoliter is, is the most that you, would, that you would add of that product. And that would probably get rid of most of those copper bound sulfides. Will elemental sulfur settle out of white wines over, overnight? Um, that's a good question. Elemental sulfur, I believe can attach itself to other things and it is a, uh, it can be a solid that precipitates, um, but whether it's all removed after settling, I'm not exactly sure of. Um, I think it does bind itself to some great material and can be removed, but whether it all is removed from the, from the juice from settling, I, I can't tell you that off the top of my head. Sorry, sorry, Edward. But if you email me that question and remind me, then I will, um, I will go ahead and try and find the answer for you. Matt LB asks, your slide showing yen lowering H2S production didn't show the total yen in those musts. How to interpret? Um, 
just interpret it like that yan increasing the yan uh, helps to lower the h2s levels again it's it's a matter of looking at what your like what your total bricks are um obviously the the yeast selection is going to be important as well because some yeast require more yan than others so that's that's another factor to include but in general increasing your yan levels is a is a good way of eliminating some of that reduction that can appear so um just something to to keep in mind it's not a hard fast um rule but um but yeah keep keep in mind 10 milligrams per liter per bricks fermented is a good metric for going off of how much yan you need to have uh, for fermentation to avoid some of that reduction Edward Boyce asks, if you settle white juice overnight, does the elemental sulfur settle out? And that's, I've already tried to answer that question. So Alec Fraser asked, does fermentation tannin have an effect on reduction? We have heard some winemakers, <coughs> excuse me. We have heard some winemakers um, state that the use of the fermentation tannin can help with reduction. I think it depends on how severe the reduction is and what kind of reduction it is. For H2S, no, I do not believe that the fermentation tannin helps with H2S. I don't think it helps with H2S. I think it helps with mercaptans. Uh, so you can have some effect on mercaptans, but for hydrogen sulfide, like eggy kind of aromas or um, you know any of that kind of H2S based reduction, your best bet during fermentation is oxygen, a lot of oxygen during fermentation to blow off the, the H2S. So it's during fermentation, lots of oxygen, post-fermentation, start looking at using tannins or copper sulfate, depending on the kind of reduction that you have. UN says, what is the mechanism of mercaptans binding tannins? Um, well, I don't actually know that answer yet, UN. That's something that hasn't really been well studied yet. Um, that paper that was done in 2001 was something that uh, really didn't go into the depth of the mechanism of the binding. And it's something that I haven't seen other researchers pay attention to yet. Hopefully somebody uh, decides to pick it up and, and do a little um, studying on it. Um, but I don't know that exact mechanism, but we do, we do suspect that it's a binding uh, mechanism. Matt Alvey says your slides. Okay, we already talked about that. Zachary says, what are the observed impacts on texture and mouthfeel from PVI PVP finding when used to settle copper bound sulfur molecules. So PVI PVP is a finding agent uh, similar to PVPP in terms of it can remove some hydroxycinamates that have bitterness. Um, it does remove a tiny bit of color, not much, just a little bit. Um, and it does have a little bit of an impact on the mouthfeel um, because it is a finding agent. The best way to be able to uh, see that for yourself is to request a sample and then just do a benchtop trial. Um, and you'll see that in some wines, it actually cleans up the wines really well and removes some bitterness. Um, and it just depends on the dosage that you're using. Um, but in, in general, it tends to be you know, fairly gentle on the, on, the, on the impact of the wine. It's not like um, carbon or something like that. It's, it, fares, it tends to be fairly gentle. Scott Albert, do these tannin additions affect desirable file uh, levels in white and rosé wines? That is a great question, Scott. Um, in white and rosé wines, you may bind some files, I believe. Um, so if you're dealing with, let's say, a really thiolic Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, you're weighing your options against, are you going to deal with the reduction that's present? Um, you know, you, you have, if you have bad reduction present, are you gonna, what are you gonna do to deal with that um, and is that worse than, you know, the, the, the potential for binding some of the good files as well? But I do believe that those tannins are not, you know, selective for just bad files. I think maybe you do bind some good files as well. Um, so for thiolic varieties, certainly doing benchtop trials is the, is the best sort of course of action to make sure that you're not going to bind too much of the good files. But you could see that effect. And rosés, I don't think... I don't think rosés tend to have quite as much thiols as some of uh, the skin fermented whites or things like that. Um, but just just something to keep in mind uh, that that is a potential um, that is a potential thing to, to consider. Clairol HM and Stable Met, why would you choose one over the other? So 
I tend to lean more towards Clairol HM because we see it work more effectively in different kinds of wines and it's cheaper than the stable net. So it's less expensive um, per gram uh, and it works as well, if not better than the, the stable net. So that's the one I tend to lean towards. So uh, Thomas asks, can storing topping wine in sealed stainless steel container cause reduction? I think so. If you have that reduction present as a um, as a disulfide or as a copper bound sulfide, then basically in a sealed stainless steel container, what happens is it becomes reductive and, and that can release either it can break a disulfide and the mercaptan becomes evident, or you can release that copper bound sulfide and have issues there. Sandy McNeil asks, is there a Canadian supplier of Venardis products? Uh, there is. Um, Bosa Grape is one of our carriers. Uh, so I believe they're in, they're in BC, I think in Vancouver actually. Uh, they carry our products. Um, we're still looking for distribution in some other areas of Canada. So if you have any ideas, feel free to email us. Um, but right now Bosa Grape is, um, is our main uh, carrier. David Goldfarb says, Cooper's Oxide from Vineyard Sprays ever create issues in the winery? That is a great question. Um, potentially, I, I don't know that I've seen any studies done on that, but I'm suspecting if you're, if you're spraying copper in the vineyard and it's, it's on the skins of the, of the fruit at any point, then maybe you would, be, uh, you would be bringing it in, especially let's say if it's on the, the leaf material or something and you have mechanically harvested fruit, I could see that as, as um, increasing the copper levels. Um, but I don't know that I've seen any studies done on that. So it would be interesting to see how strongly that effect um, is. John Lovenberg asks, what was the rate of addition of PVI PVP that showed effective removal of copper sulfides? I think we already answered that question. Smith Aguilar, I'm looking at the technical sheets for Clairol HM and StableMet and see where the legal limits for the EU are mentioned, but nothing for the US. Are these products TTB approved? They are TTB approved. Uh, they are under the 24250, so it's not approved for uh, export wines, but for domestic use it is. And um, the dosage rates that are for legal limits, I believe that the um, that it goes up to 80 grams per hectoliter, but I'm not exactly sure. I have to look again at our compliance. Um, but you probably, I mean, probably you would use as much as 50 grams per hectoliter. Uh, I think that's probably the highest dosage that you would want to work with anyway. So, and that's certainly a legal dosage. Josh Thayden says, I've never run into enough sulfide to need copper, just aerating the wine. Should I be worried about sulfides that will come back on the wine? If you're aerating the, uh, if you're aerating sulfides and you're putting that product inside of a screw cap or inside of a can, then you may want to worry about the sulfides reappearing. If that wine is going to remain in a fairly oxidative environment, you may not have those issues appear. Um, but if you, if that wine is ever in a reductive condition, then I would be worried. Paul O'Neill asks, why does Clairol HM have ascorbic acid in it? Any reasons for choosing stable met or Clairol HM? Uh, yeah, Clairol HM is, again, I think that's probably my preferred product to use. Um, uh, the ascorbic acid is part of the process for, um, for the uh, processing of the chitosan fraction of it. So that's an important piece of the uh, production of it. So it's not a lot of ascorbic acid, it's just a little bit. Uh, any reasons for choosing the two? Again, it's Clairol HM because it's a little bit less expensive and it works better in most wines. That's that's why I would use that product over the Stable Net. But they both work well, so either one either one would work fine. <clears throat> what do you think of restoring reductive wine, in my case cider, with a copper rod? More harm than help? I would probably treat a wine more with uh, with copper sulfate rather than a copper rod because that that's a more controlled uh, addition of copper so you know how much copper you're adding with a copper rod it's like I have no idea how much copper that's adding um, so I, I mean you could probably test to see how much copper you're adding with that kind of treatment but I think probably copper sulfate is super inexpensive and, and probably a little bit more controlled if you're going to be adding copper uh, Alec Fraser do SO2 levels affect treatment of sulfides and wine will high SO2 bind sulfides, thus making treatment less effective. Um, SO2 levels, um, in terms of 
if you're treating with ascorbic acid, SO2 is important as a, uh, a as a component to capture any peroxide that's produced from the treatment with the ascorbic. So I think SO2 is important for that. Um, I don't know that SO2 is going to bind sulfides uh, per se, uh, making the treatment less effective. I think um, I think you want to have a little bit of sulfite present, especially if you're adding copper from the oxidative standpoint. Um, I mean, sulfur does play an important role in redox chemistry, and I don't know that it it prevents the uh, treatment, not that I've seen. So I think you're okay to use sulfite, a little bit of sulfite when, when you're treating with copper and, and ascorbic acid. I think that's fine. Josh Satan says, I have sulfite problems with the same wines. Do specific fruits or grape varieties have recurring problems? There are varieties that are more prone to certain sulfides. So that is something that's um, variety dependent. But if it's from the same blocks of, of, uh, of fruit, it could be a more, um, it could be something that's a little bit more uh, systematic. It could be that, you know, depending on the block, maybe that one is being sprayed more with elemental sulfur. Or maybe let's say that that block has a has a deficiency in pantothenic acid. Um, so that that could be the two things that you consider first is find out how much sulfur is being sprayed in the vineyard, um, and then also look at what the nutri uh, nutrition is for that particular vineyard. Uh, I think those are the first things to approach with with that problem. Cindy McNeil and I know I'm going over over time here, so if, if you guys can't um, stay for this. For the rest of the question and answers, I understand, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and keep going through these questions. Is there any benefit of, of coarse filtration prior to enological tannin add, or is settling to uh, to a certain clarity or length of time beneficial? Um, I don't think that there's any reason to do a coarse filtration prior to the tannin addition. I think you can make the tannin addition to a wine that has some turbidity and, and not have any difficulty. Um, Probably a super turbid wine, it might you might lose some of the binding of the tannin to some of the, the fractions in the wine. So maybe just a racking before the addition of the tannin would help. Um, in general, racking off of a reductive lees is a good idea anyways, because the some of the pulp material can sometimes uh, cause more reduction issues as well. And so, and also sometimes lees can become reductive. So sometimes racking uh, could can work um, and if, if you were trying to get a clearer product before the addition, I would I would certainly rack it before the addition. Do you recommend for dealing with wines prone to reduction like Sauvignon Blanc destined for cans? So um, one, I would just make sure that you try to follow the some of the guidelines that we presented in this uh, in this material. Two, if you're treating with um, copper sulfate, make sure that one, I would look at that paper from the AWRI on um, on the filtration of copper bound sulfides. And I would also consider uh, treatment of that product if it, if it is reductive or has been reductive and treated with copper, I would consider treating that with Clairol HM to remove the copper bound sulfides before going in the can. Uh, also, um, I mean, we're, gonna, we're probably gonna be doing a, a presentation on canning this year within the next couple of months. So stay tuned for that because we're gonna have a pretty good lineup of speakers and also information on canning. So um, I can answer more of those questions at that time, but for Sauvignon Blanc going into a can, just try to follow some of the guidelines we talked about. If the wine's been treated with copper sulfate, remove it with uh, with some kind of PVI, PVP containing blend. Can having very high yan levels also cause more H2S production of vintages with 450 plus yan that still produce H2S. Should I add a yan to those circumstances? If you have 450, um, milligrams per liter of yan, uh, then yeah, I, you would do not need to add any yan to that. That's got plenty, unless you're fermenting a 50 bricks must. Uh, that's that's plenty of yan. I wouldn't add any more to that. Um, you can still produce H2S with high uh, yan levels. So it just depends on the yeast as well. Uh, that's again, something that I didn't have time to really get into, but um, certain yeast can produce uh, H2S with higher yan levels. And so if you have these really high yan must, just talk to your um, your yeast provider about um, strains that they might recommend for those high yan situations. And then also uh, consider the elemental sulfur factor as well. Uh, so high, how much uh, sulfur they're using in the vineyard because that, that can also impact those things. Bonnie Fisher asks, 
how do you incorporate oxygen in the fermentation? There's several different ways you can do that. You can do pump overs, you could do um, pulse air, you can do um, punch downs. Probably a rack and return is the best way to get oxygen in a fermentation um, because even when you're doing a pump over, sometimes a pump over, the, the hose will go back into the fermenter where you still have CO2 and not a lot of oxygen present. So you're not getting a huge amount of oxygen. So I think a rack and return um, is probably the best way to, uh, to really get a lot of oxygen in the fermentation. Or pulse air. Pulse air works great for that. Does bound cannon mercaptan settle out filterable? I don't know that those interactions settle out. Again, it's it's still new, I think, to the industry in terms of the interactions between tannin and mercaptans. Um, I don't think it's filterable. Um, I don't think you'd filter it out. But again, it's something that I'm I'm still we don't know much about it, and it's still a new a newer treatment. What number should we call to get samples? Thanks. Uh, just call our main line if you go to an artist USA uh, website. And, uh, and and go to our, our main line there. You'll find um, you'll find that that number is easily accessible. Sure, so got art. Does pH have an effect on H2S production? High pH wines have higher H2S. I'm sure it does. Uh, I don't know off the top of my head how pH plays into the redox chemistry. I'm sure it does have an effect, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry, Sarah. Josh stayed in. I use Scott Labs products and use fermentation. Tin FT roos just each to us break up easier by using more more FT tanneries than I normally do. So I should also ask uh, Scott Labs about that. Um, we don't carry their products, so I can't really speak to um, to their use of their products for fermentation. Scott Albert asks, what's the difference between these recommended tannins and any other logic of tannin? Um, that's a good question. I think the fact that the, the tan SLI I think works so well because it's a untoasted tannin. And it's treated in a way that it doesn't have any, um, its extraction doesn't have any heat, which is a really unique uh, way of getting tannin out of the um, out of the oak. So I think that specific situation is what makes that tannin so effective for um, for removing the uh, the sulfides. But I think other allergic tannins probably have similar properties, or have, probably have properties that also help them with production as well. I say now, how much, I never really know how much yan is in my wine. I just wait till it starts to smell eggy before I fix nitrogen. Is it too late? I usually fix it before I have anything, have to do anything else. Uh, usually you want to measure your yan before fermentation starts uh, just so that you have an idea of, of uh, how much you have and how much you need to supplement if you do. Um, usually you want to sparge with oxygen to get, try and get rid of the uh, H2S. Um, so I usually, we usually recommend, you can get like a, uh, a, these kits that can help measure yan. We sell them. Uh, they're yeast by assimilable nitrogen, um, or yeast assimilable nitrogen kits, and you just need a spectrophotometer to use them and a pipette. Uh, so if you're interested in those, you can, you can reach out and we're, we're happy to help you get that started as well. Or you can just submit the uh, samples to a, a lab like our Zinquiry labs and we'll be able to do the analysis for you. Floyd Oslin asks, I have a problem every year at Pinot Gris. What can I do? Uh, I would, again, look into the conditions of the fruit. If you have uh, um, sulfur um, spraying, if there's a lot of sulfur spraying, um, look at the yan levels and start from those, um, start taking off those boxes in terms of um, trying different things to try and deal with it. I think if you approach um, it from that perspective, you should be able to fix the reduction, but hard to tell what the problem is with Pinot Gris without starting to, to try those different things first. So. That would be my recommendation. And this is the last one that I'll read from Brian Miller here. If my fruit has high elemental sulfur from close vineyard sprays to picking time, should I decrease the amount of SO2 I add? If I do, how do I protect my fruit from spontaneous fermentation from other microbes? I don't think it's a reason to limit the SO2 that you add because of the elemental sulfur. I think if you have elemental sulfur on the fruit, you're going to have reduction no matter what. Um, I think what you should consider is one, I mean, you should limit the amount of SO2 that you add in the first place um, so that you're not adding too much. But two, uh, you'll just have to, you'll have to sparge with a lot of oxygen during fermentation to try and get rid of some of that, some of that and blow off some of that um, sulfur. That's probably the only sort of method that you'll be able to use for, for treating that, uh, that batch is just, if you know you have high elemental sulfur, you know you're gonna have to give it a ton of oxygen during fermentation to try and deal with that, um, that sulfur.
Uh, even white fermentations are okay to give oxygen to, uh, as long as it's in the early part of the fermentation and the later phases of the fermentation, you don't want to add as much oxygen, obviously, because it can oxidize the wine. But in the early part of the fermentation, the wine can can have a lot of oxygen that will help with the H2S and also help with the yeast as well. So what, that would be my answer is more, if you have elemental sulfur, use the generous uh, oxygen during fermentation um, and you know, use, always limit the amount of SO2 that you that you use just in those situations. Okay, well, I think that's all the questions I have time for now. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We're going to send a follow-up email with uh, the presentation um, in a PDF form for you. We'll also send out uh, the uh, recording in the form of a, a link. And um, yeah, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to my, uh, my email. I'll put that up again on the, the board here. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate your time and, uh, and hope that you have a good uh, rest of your day.